and, others, and this one now is hard on the bar because that gum to speed over the start finish line and that wants to be at the maximum as Senna starts his last attempt to put his car onto the front road, front row of the grid, and preferably by his standards onto pole position. Patrese has used both sets of tyres, Mansell hasn't, so Patrese can't respond, and Senna is looking to do that to get under 1 minute 22.1 seconds. That's Patrese's time, 22.109, and he has that to beat. So down the hangar straight, Gaz and Senna. Berger has also started a flower, half a minute behind Senna. We can't watch both of them, I'm afraid to say. And Berger bidding to improve his current fifth position on the grid. His first starting of the day, but Berger has another lap, another set of tires to take afterwards. And Senna through out of club corner. Through the left hander at Abbey. Flat out through bridge corner. And then hard onto the brakes and into the complex. Slower car giving him the space he needed. And there's the center now. Two corners to go. Oh, and he was giving it everything. Oh. Yeah, that's it to be. 121, 618, and that's pole for Ayrton Senna. Hi folks, welcome back to the channel, thank you very much for joining me once again. You are always most welcome. Well, a slight change of theme and flavour today. We're going to talk about Senna versus Prost. Now I, <laughs> I am a, a huge fan of Formula 1 and always have been since I was about 6 or 7 years old really. And I actually think this era of Senna versus Prost, as many others do actually, was probably perhaps the golden age of Formula One. There was a couple of golden ages earlier. You, had, you know, you had Fangio and you had uh, Nivellari, people like that. And then you had, you know, the Sterling Moss uh, Fangio era. And then it, that morphed into sort of Jim Clark, Graham Hill, Jackie Stewart. Then Nicky Lauda, James Hunt came along. Uh, and then you had uh, the sort of uh, Villeneuve, uh, sort of PK. Uh, Alan Jones era and those guys um, and then Senna arrived uh, well, Prost was in that gang as well of course because he, he came in in 1980 so Senna arrived in 1984 most of you know the story most of you will know a lot of what I'm going to talk about um, sadly of course uh, for a moment there you probably did a double take and thought that the king was back uh, the legend of Formula 1 but sadly not I can't see a damn thing in his aviator glasses I'm going to remove, respectfully remove his hat uh, the National, the Banco National hat, which of course he was synonymous for wearing quite a lot of the time. So I'm going to re respectfully take that off. And we're going to talk about, and I've got the, yes, I've got the Senna shirt, look at that. <laughs> so I've already set my stall out, haven't I? Or have I? We shall see, we shall see. Those of you that are big Senna fans and love Formula One from that era are going to enjoy this, I think. Um, some of what I say you will fervently agree with, some of it you will probably disagree with. And some of it you won't be sure about, I suspect, because there's one or two facts that um, people are not aware of. A lot of people have got their information from Senna, especially younger folks today. If you're under 40, you probably got most of your information from the Senna movie. Um, and I have to tell you, that film is something I enjoyed tremendously. I went to the cinema to see it. But I did actually walk out the cinema... Or even halfway through the film, I was shaking my head in, in not in disgust, but in some dismay about the way that the facts were presented. And it reminds me of you know, if you go to court, uh, you are sworn in, uh, and, and if you're a witness in court, they say you must tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the problem with that movie is it doesn't tell the whole truth. And there's a couple of incidents in particular that were just ignored and glossed over and not even addressed at all and I'm going to mention those today. So um, Senna came in in, uh, in, in 84 as, a, as a, uh, an upcoming uh, 
newcomer in the Tolman team. Most of you know that he went to the Monaco Grand Prix, very nearly won it in the pouring rain, terrible conditions. And they actually, uh, this is where, in a way, where the problems all begin, right at the beginning because, of Senna's career, because Senna, by right, should have won that race and was going to win it, and they cut the race short. Uh, a, a Prost was leading, and they cut it a lap short, even than what they said they were going to do. Uh, and that was um, the race official in charge was actually Jackie X, but our old friend Jean-Marie Balestra had his hands all over this. We're going to talk about him in a few seconds. Um, I'll pop up a picture of him, so you'll you'll know him from the Senna movie. He was the the very uh, dictatorial, autocratic, and frankly overbearing head of the FIA. I'm going to put my normal glasses on because I can't see a darn thing. Uh, he was the head of the FIA. Or FISA as it was then, um, and really wasn't very popular with many people in the sport, frankly. You know, from Ron Dennis through to the drivers, and uh, Chapman didn't like him, and I don't think Ken Tyrrell was very keen on him, and, and he was a difficult guy. Um, nothing to do with his nationality, it was more the way he conducted himself, and you can see that in the Senna movie. So I'm not going to diss the Senna movie, I think 75% of it is excellent. But there's a lot of people that commentate in that film, which I don't think... I'm, I'm not sure, some of them are journalists, but I'm not sure they knew a lot more than I did as a very keen enthusiast. Uh, and Ron Dennis himself actually dismissed some of the some of the contributors, one or two of them, he said, were people that didn't really know Senna, I didn't really know anything that they were talking about. So uh, a lot of the commentators who these talking heads they have that make the comments in that movie, the value of some of that isn't isn't as strong as you think it is. They gloss over a lot of facts, which are quite important facts, uh, and they give this very partial view of this rivalry between these two drivers, which became legend, of course. Uh, sadly, because of course Senna, Senna died in that horrible accident in '94. We'll talk about that as well. But um, yeah, the FIA had a had a hand in it, um, and I say that the film does portray that quite well. Uh, I don't think it's. I don't think it's um, over the top in the way it portrays Balestra. If anything, it's, it's fairly easy on him, frankly, from what I've heard. Uh, you only got to ask Ron Dennis about that, I think, and he'll tell you. But anyway, uh, in other areas, the film was it skips over important parts of the story that that are germane to why this rivalry got so out of hand. I think um, now I'm not probably going to reveal anything new. I'm sure I'm, I haven't got any inside information, but I was following this very very closely I, I, I lived and breathed for it I actually went um, to Silverstone in 1988 which is the the first year that Senna went to McLaren we'll talk about that in a minute but <coughs> excuse me I've got to get my obligatory Honda mug out because this is all about Honda I'm going to talk about really talk about Senna's career I, I'm not going to go into details about a huge detail about when Senna wasn't at McLaren. I'm going to mainly talk about McLaren and also give some views about what I think happened to, to him in the accident. Um, not, I'm not going to go into any gratuitous detail about his injuries or anything like that, but what caused it really. I have my own views on that, which other people, most people, are fed by, you know, what's been reported, the official reports. And When the official report came out of the accident, I was astonished because I thought it was complete nonsense. But anyway, I was watching it lap by lap, as many people were, and I think there's a far simpler explanation for what happened causing that terrible accident. We'll get into that later. Mm. It tastes very powerful coming out of a Honda mug, this. Oof. Mm. Anyway, so, I'm going to be doing a review. Um, I think I'm going to do the review of the kit, actually, the lovely Meng McLaren. 12 scale. I'm going to do the review separately because it's going to be quite a long review and this, this program that I'm filming now, it could really, it really could go on and on and on for, for hours frankly because I could talk about this for uh, uh, many many hours. But I just want to say to you, and I'll mention this again when I do the second, I'm going to do it in two parts. So I'm going to, this is Prost versus Senna, the second one will be Prost versus Senna Meng review of the actual MP44. I think doing it that way um, makes it more of a, a manageable size for you to watch. Don't want people to get fed up. Um, so, so there we go. So um, we're gonna, I'm going to talk now about the sort of historic side of it. So um, Senna, of course, um, was cheated out of this win, which caused immediate antipathy, I think, between him and Prost. 
and the fact that Prost was very well connected with Balestra at the at the FIA. I'll show you a picture of Balestra, those of you that maybe don't remember him. If you would bear, bear with me just one second, um, we will find you a picture of uh, of his nibs, who was the president of the FISA. Uh, da, 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 da. See all. Bear with me. I will. Picture of Colin Chapman there. Are we? We're not actually talking about him today. Here we go. Inevitably, this is the man we're talking about. Sorry about that. So this is the guy we're talking about. This is the chap that you may recall, and in the movie, he typically autocratically. Uh, he's giving a lecture to the drivers in the driver's briefing and he said the best decision is my decision yeah and he also says um, before the Japanese Grand Prix I think it was he said <laughs> famously says a big tall chap he was and he said all the people around the world on the TV are watching you thinking you are an example for drivers stupidly stupidly and they're all looking at each other thinking you know he treated people like children. He was terrible, terrible. Not a good ambassador for the sport at all. I mean, he got replaced by Max Mosley and everybody thought that was a great thing, which tells you how bad he was, really. Because <laughs> Max Mosley... Mm, anyway, we'll get to that. So you remember this guy. Um, now, I've got... What I'm going to do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got some photographs. I've, I've got a very short collection of photographs which I wanted to flick through in relation to this subject. Uh, which I think you'll enjoy. I think you'll enjoy if I zoom them in. Um, so basically, I, I'll, I'll sort of get to the start of the story and then I'll walk you through chronologically these photos with my thoughts and, and what I observed. Uh, and I saw Senna many, many times. Uh, I saw him at Silverstone. Um, was it only Silverstone? I think it was actually only Silverstone at that time that I was going to in those days. Because I couldn't really afford to travel around the world. Like Later I went to circuits like Monaco and and Estoril and Spa, but I didn't then because I did. I was a lot younger. I didn't have the money, you know. Obviously, <laughs> <clears throat> but I was what you call a super fan. My personal favourite driver of the era was actually Nigel Mansell, and I think it was for a lot of Brits. Nigel was not perhaps the most uh, interesting character, but when he got behind the wheel of a Formula One car, he was absolutely mustard, you know. He was very exciting, which is why the Italians loved him so much when he eventually went to Ferrari. And the other driver, of course, in this uh, in this quartet was Nelson Piquet, and Nelson Piquet was this sort of another Brazilian, uh, slightly playboyish, if I'm honest, in the way he came across, but very clever behind the wheel, very, very skilled, no question, and very fast, very, very fast driver. And then you had Prost. Now, so Senna was at Tolman, and obviously Tolman wasn't good enough for team. He was clearly a very talented guy. And he moved on to Lotus in 1985, 86 and 87. Now Lotus were probably a good place for him to be a, a learning ground for his craft. Uh, and of course he demonstrated, he had a number of wins. Uh, I think he won his second race at Lotus at the, in the Portuguese Grand Prix in 1985, which tells you how good he was. Okay. But our friend Prost here was the established... Uh, he was the established star at McLaren and had been there now for since he left Renault, so he'd been there since '84. And um, he'd already won. Uh, he won the world title in '85. He won it again in '86 against expectations. He'd beaten by Lauda, of course, in his first year in '84 <coughs> by half a point, of course. <laughs> anyway. Um, he was very much the established guy, and he had he had friends with Balestra, he had friends in high places. Uh, and after uh, three years at Lotus, Lotus were early on the decline, even though they had some clever ideas. They had this active suspension, which Senna used to great effect. He won the race in Detroit and in Monaco in '87. Uh, you can you can get the um, is it B Max? I think they do a nice twelve scale '87 Monaco Grand Prix winning car. Just be wary though. People get a bit carried away if they don't know the facts. The only reason Ayrton Senna, I'm not, I'm not knocking Ayrton here at all, but the only reason Senna won in 87 at Monaco was, was Nigel Mansell's exhaust broke and lost exhaust pressure um, and his turbo. Um, he was dominating the 87 Monaco Grand Prix. Mansell was streets ahead, quite literally, pardon the pun. And then he had this breakage. He, he was so unlucky at Monaco and, and Senna was so lucky at Monaco. 
Uh, so that first, um, his first Monaco win, Senna's, it was actually a fluke, really. Uh, I mean, he was there and he had the skill and the speed, but his car wasn't as good as the Williams, and that's, that's the reason he won, because it was a car problem. But from then on, he became the master of Monaco and took over the, the mantle of Graham, Graham Hill in that respect. So, Ron Dennis, the, the uh, mercurial, um, very OCD, very, very uh, professional and highly organised genius that ran McLaren. Um, they'd been in the doldrums for a year or two, really. They were on the decline, not, not, not as a team, but in terms of performance. And it was really down to the tag Porsche turbo engine, which was basically getting out class by the Honda. And Williams had been running the Honda and they're running rings around the, uh, the, the McLarens, you know, through no fault of the teams. Um, now, I should say at this point, there is a fantastic video, that's two versions of it, which I'm going to put a link to at the bottom of this. Uh, and it's by JM on Cars. Many of you may watch JM on Cars. He's a car reviewer by trade. But he, um, brilliantly at Christmas a couple of years ago, he actually had this long video interview with Steve Nichols, who was the designer along with Gordon Murray and others, who designed the MP44 that we'll talk about. I'll talk about that more in the next episode, but there is a brilliant video uh, explaining everything about this car and how they conceived it, how it was created and how they ran it. And it's absolutely fascinating. If you love engineering and motor racing Formula 1, you'll find that absolutely amazing to watch. It's absorbing. You can watch it over and over and they talk about tiny details of how they arrived at certain design choices and the challenges that they faced. Problems with things going wrong, breaking down. and It's absolutely amazing. If you love cars and engineering, you must see the video. Uh, Jim, I like Jim on cars as a channel, but it's the best thing he's ever done. And he doesn't speak in it. He just, apart from, he does the intro at the beginning and then that's it. And there's like an hour of these guys just talking. And you have Neil Trundle as well, the chief, he was the chief mechanic. Um, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, Neil Oatley was the chief engineer on the team as well. He's not actually featured in that video, but you've got to go and see it. Anyway, moving on. Ron Dennis basically then decides that he's going to sign Senna because um, Rosberg decides to retire at the end of '86. <coughs> they have, excuse me, <coughs> they have Johansson as a stopgap in '87, and he, he realizes he needs a top driver to partner Prost, and he signs Senna. So this is where I'm going to show you the pictures. So I'm going to zoom in now, talk over the pictures. If you'll oblige me, and we'll just have a little walk through this. I think some of you find it very interesting. So, whoops, I knew that was going to happen. So, uh, I just mentioned that Senna was a massive fan. Uh, many of you will know this probably from the movie. He was a huge fan of, um, in fact, I'm not sure if that was featured in the movie. It was certainly featured in some of the documentaries about him. Radio control model aircraft, which I have in it, a passion for as well. He was really into this. He was a brilliant uh, radio control flyer. Uh, and it was obviously an extension of using those same reflexes and skills that he did behind the car. And he was, uh, yeah, he was a massive uh, uh, exponent and ambassador for the hobby, you might say. Now this is a photo of uh, when Ronda. I'm just going to raise this up actually because we think just need a little bit more height. I think don't we? For our, for our That's better. There we go. So this is the announcement to the press of Ron Dennis on the right, who signed Senna as the new driver. For 1988 uh, to partner Prost, who's the established champion. Um, PK actually won the, 90, uh, the 87 title, of course, because Mansell had another terrible accident at the end and hurt his spine at the qualifying for the Japanese Grand Prix. I think this was taken, this picture was taken at the Portuguese Grand Prix, that's where they had the announcement. Uh, and then this one is when I'm basically testing, I think, at Estoril, I think it is, uh, in the spring of. Um, is it Estoril? I just wonder if it was like Barcelona, but they didn't go to Barcelona in those days, that was before it was built, so it wasn't there. During one of the tests, anyway, it might be Jerez. Anyway, this is when Senna was first introduced as an actual driver. You can see how he looks quite young. Uh, and so they start their 1988 campaign. And, the, and this is an interesting photograph we have here. This is the MP44, which is this car that was so successful, winning 15 out of 16 races. And this is at the first race, the Brazilian Grand Prix. Uh, and this is when, I believe, this is at the start, just before the start of the race. Senna had a problem, which is explained in great detail in the other video I mentioned, where his, his gear knob shifter failed, and he had no means to shift the, the, the gears as he was on the grid. 
<coughs> and in the end, they, had to, they, were, they were forced to push him off. He jumped into the spare car, but he started. Um, he didn't start immediately when they were given the green light at the end of the pit lane. He, he, there was like 20, 30 second delay, and he, ultimately he made his way up through the field, but got disqualified, got black flag, which is very unfortunate. So that's quite an interesting picture. This photograph of the MP44, I'm just going to zoom you out for this. Um, now, this, this photo was taken by yours truly, myself. Uh, and this was taken on the 8th of uh, July, 1988, at the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Senna here is just exiting the pit lane to go off on his, uh, one of his first uh, qualifying sessions. Uh, it's taken about... 11 a.m. in the morning, something like that. But yeah, I was quite into my photography then, and uh, it's not the best picture ever, but it's it's quite it's quite a decent one. I thought I it's quite a decent photo. You can clearly see it is Senna. It leaves you no doubt at all. Uh, who's driving that car? Uh, and yeah, and I'm actually quite proud of that photo. It's one of my best ever sort of uh, sort of historic. I did take a lot of pictures of Senna over the years, but that's probably one of the better ones in fairness, uh, composition-wise and everything else. So that's Silverstone, which he won, of course, in the rain. This, this sadly, is not taken by me. A much nicer photo, it has to be said. Um, <coughs> and that's, uh, this is during the campaign in 88, where he got the upper hand of Prost, of course, and he, he ended up winning the, uh, the championship. Now, this is the first picture I wanted to really talk about. So, this relationship between Prost and Senna, which is, is talked about in the Senna movie, and I'm not going to go over it and tell every detail, but... This is one of the things the Senna movie completely glosses over. This photograph is very important. This is the, this is the second lap of the Portuguese Grand Prix in 1988, September. Um, Senna had um, a good start. Prost was on pole. And Prost edged, him, edged Senna a little bit toward the grass. He didn't do it very forcibly. But he had Senna just, just wisping his tyre against the grass. Which was quite aggressive from Prost and unusual. And then this is what happened on the second lap, and this is Senna retaliating much more aggressively again. And this is where things really start to actually go wrong, which is completely glossed over and never mentioned in the Senna movie. So they come down at the start of the second lap, and Senna forces Prost, he doesn't quite do it justice because he was quite aggressive in the way he made the move. And he forces Prost right up against the pit wall, as you can see, where there's plenty of track for them both. And this is where it all starts to really go wrong. That was logged clearly by Prost, and he wasn't happy about it. Um, and I know he's talked about it in interviews in his book. Here we go again. And again, Prost is up, and Prost moves to the left to try and cross Senna out. Senna is right up alongside as they go into turn one, and Ayrton Senna takes the lead, as he did on the second start. McLaren, leads, McLaren second, Capelli well up in third place, Berger in fourth position. Sweeping down now into turn three. This is. They go round. Here it is now. It's Senna. And there's going to be a tremendous roar from the Brazilian crowd. And they're here in their thousands, supported by the Portuguese who very much support Ayrton Senna. And they're all around me now, giving it a lot of cheering and flag waving. So. As we have seen many times in the past, the V6 Honda powered 650 horsepower McLarens of Senna and Prost are on their way, but there is going to be a fight because we understand that it is every man for himself in the McLaren team now. Senna has seven wins, Prost has four, they're already pulling away from Ivan Capelli in third position with Gerhard Berger in the Ferrari four. It's going to be interesting to see what Prost can do about Senna being in front of him because Prost certainly seems to be in very good form here, but uh, he, he wasn't as brave as Ayrton Senna into the first corner. He was a little bit early on the brakes and Prost having a look and Senna's crowding him into the pit wall and Prost is on, I would think, full boost and Prost goes through to take the lead. Uh, Prost is much happier with the setup of his car than Ayrton Senna has been weekend and uh, it'll be interesting to see if Prost can in fact start to build up any sort of a lead. That 
was an inspired bit of driving by Alain Prost. I said earlier on that the Frenchman has not given up this season. Whoever thought he would, 32 Grand Prix wins more than anybody else. And that is Nanini in the pits in the Benetton. So Alessandro Nanini, Nanini is having a terrible Portuguese Grand Prix already after his terrible Italian Grand Prix. And let us look now at Alain Prost taking the lead from Ayrton Senna, followed by Capelli and Berger. It's an almost Formula 3 star tactics by Senna there. He was pushing Prost across the track, almost into the pit ball, just gave him a car width. Uh, and Prost uh, was not daunted by that. Stayed on the throttle. And uh, as you can see now, break later into the first corner. So Prost takes the lead at the end of lap one, or the beginning of lap two, to be exact. Then we get on, you can see the, the sort of relationship starts to deteriorate a little bit here. Yeah, and Ron Dennis is now trying to manage these two, these two guys. Um, I, th I think if you were to try and sum them up in, in a sort of simplistic way, these two characters, they were both really quick. People underestimate Prost, he was fast. Yeah, he was really fast. But he wasn't quite as ultimately committed as Senna. Senna was like this samurai warrior. In fact, I think I was explaining to somebody the other day, and I said the best way to try and describe these two, imagine Senna... If you were explaining, explaining it to a child, I'd say they were both brilliant drivers, but psychologically, Senna was like Yoda, unafraid of death as we know, and prepared to do almost anything to defend what he thought was, was, was do what was needed. And Prost was like Albert Einstein. So you almost had, you could say, religion versus science is one way of thinking of it. And perhaps I'm slightly over-exaggerating it, but I think a lot of people would recognise that, yeah, that's one simplistic way to describe their psychological approach to motor racing in Formula One and the way they went about it. Prost was a scientist, very methodical, he worked everything out. This is a guy that was quite prepared to run around in 7th, 8th place during a Grand Prix. He did it in races like British Grand Prix 85, I think. Well, he was, he was just not a factor and he just gradually crept through to the front as the race went on. Conserving his fuel, conserving his tyres, and he's very good at that. A good thinking driver. Senna was more like, you know, uh, sort of a Hamilton stroke Verstappen character wants to win the race on the first corner. Uh, and then and then dominate it from there on in. So quite different characters. Quite different characters. So things are now getting a little bit tetchy between them. They're not at war yet, but it's getting a little bit challenging. And Ron Dennis knows this. This is the Japanese Grand Prix where this is Senna ultimately overtaking Prost toward the end of the race and actually taking the lead to win the world title. Now this is very important. This is the second big big issue. This is the accident, some of you may remember it, that the following year, Senna is now world champion, but this is the horrible crash that Gerhard Berger suffered in his Ferrari 640. Um, now you might recall he was partnering Nigel Mansell who just joined the team. Um, Berger, just for no apparent reason, um, speared straight off, and this is ultimately, a, this is the corner where Senna ultimately died, uh, had his fatal accident, um, and also PK had, had a very bad accident there, where he'd gone backwards into this corner in 87, and been concussed, it was a quite a dangerous corner. quite as powerful. Oops, and big problems. That was something broken on the car for sure. Big crash by Berger. Without any doubt, it went straight on. And, oh my, oh, heavens above. This is dreadful. This is the, there is, there are no words that can add to the, this appalling picture. The car off. And thank heavens there is a fire tender on the spot immediately. The drivers at least have ox a pure air piped through to their helmets due to a special valve and the fire is out there is there is some relief now they must keep those those fire extinguishers going yes the fire, fire is out for the moment but Berger must have been hurt in that because the car is the right way up and if he hadn't been injured I'm sure he would have hopped out so this is very 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 worrying moments this is the worst possible thing that you can have happen in a motor race cars have got so safe conditions have got so safe the organization is so good that nowadays you don't expect them to be hurt but bad news the red flag is out the san marino grand prix is being stopped has been stopped on the on the fourth lap and here's a replay you see the ferrari going off there onto the grass into the wall yes you see 
that in fact uh, something broke on the car because it just went straight on. The car did not uh, respond at all to Berger's turning the corner. And that was a very heavy impact. Remember Nelson Piquet uh, last year or the year before had a similar accident at the, at the same corner. Piquet also had a failure on the car and the car went straight on a very heavy impact. So there is a replay of the one thing that we never want to see again. I'm talking about this, because this stopped the race. I mean, the fire marshals in this case were absolutely brilliant. They were there within three or four seconds, certainly five, and they arrived on the scene and put this fire out incredibly quickly. And it looked, it looked fatal. It looked like Nicky Lauda's cr crash all over again. But Berger survived with only minor burns, a bit on his hand and, and chin and, and some of his hands and neck. But he was okay and he was actually racing a couple of races later. But what's important about this accident is what then subsequently um, occurred because um, the race was stopped and what, what none of us knew is that Senna and Prost had got an agreement that they would not race each other until after turn three of the first lap which they duly didn't. Uh, I'm trying to recall I think that I think Senna uh, I think Prost actually led, uh, forgive me if I get this wrong, but uh, it's kind of irrelevant now, but Prost led and the, the agreement was they wouldn't race each other until after the third turn once the race starts to settle in. I don't know why they agree this, but anyway, this is, this is the way the story goes. So then we have a restart at which uh, Prost gets ahead again, but then Senna overtakes him before they get to Tosa, which is, is basically the third corner. And Prost was very, this is, very, this is where it all goes wrong. This is almost a replay of what happened in 1982 between Peroni and Villeneuve, where they had a, a similar falling out with a similar agreement at the same circuit. So you think they'd have sort of learned the lesson from what happened with Peroni and Villeneuve. Not to get into these agreements, I don't really understand why they do that. But there we go, this is what happened. Senna went on to win the race and Prost was incandescent, absolutely furious. And this is where the bitterness and the acrimony starts. None of this is mentioned in the Senna movie, okay? Now, I'm not taking sides here. I'm not blaming. I don't know why they agreed it or what, what they think it was or whatever, or what the wisdom of it was. But this is fact, okay? And this is something you won't get from the Senna movie, and it's completely just for, his for artistic reasons. They don't want to make it look, because it's a movie, they want to make it look, you know, one guy's the good guy, one guy's the bad guy. It was much more complicated than that. So this is where it all goes wrong. And then we fast forward toward the end of that season and we've got the infamous Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka. You'll all recall uh, Senna chases Prost for lap after lap after lap. I think he's at lap 46 where finally he lunges. This is the chicane. Now he lunges up the inside with a very optimistic move, a Mark Webber type move. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. But as, as was seen, and shown in the Senna movie, in fairness, there's an overhead shot where you see that Prost turns in as if he's taken the apex way earlier than he would have done. And he, and he was really trying to stop Senna. You can argue it was his piece of road and he's his right as the leader. But he cuts across much earlier and they collide. As we... As we know, and this is the inevitable conclusion of that of that move from both of them. So they end up both collided, both engines are stalled, and they're at the uh, the entrance of the escape road. And uh, Prost jumps out, waves his hand as if to say, "Well, that serves you right," sort of thing. Senna takes none of this, insists on carrying on, gets a push from the marshals, and as we know, goes on to win the race. Uh, having ma finally managed to catch up the leader, Nanini, only to then be disqualified. <coughs> and, and again, um, Prost is portrayed as the bad guy. And on this occasion, I kind of think he was, not, not, not the accident, but the aftermath. Because even in the interview on the Senna movie, th there is a question mark where he, he quotes the facts wrongly and he says, I went straight into the garage and remonstrated with Ron Dennis. And, and somebody said, are you sure you didn't go straight to the control tower to speak to Balestra? And he, and he sort of goes, oh, uh, uh, well, I spoke to Ron Dennis in the control tower. I was never with Balestra on my own. And he sort of changes his story on camera in the movie, which is a bit, mm, yeah, okay. So, I mean, it's a long time ago, and he, there was a lot of incidents like this, so it's easy to get confused, but it doesn't help his cause. Being close to Balestra 
didn't help his cause. And again, the dynamics between these two guys that people don't appreciate is, is like this. Prost was cl close to the FIA and Balestra. Senna was close to Honda. Sen uh, Honda loved Senna because they saw him like a samurai warrior almost in terms of his, his mental approach and his commitment. And they love that. And of course, so you, en you end up with both having very powerful friends in high places. It's just got that mix of, a heady mix of dangerous materials, dangerous fuel for a big fire, which is what happened. And of course, we all know that 12 months later, it all happens again. Behind Prost is Berger, the grid is clear, the lights go. And Senna sprints away, but Alain Prost takes the lead. It's happened. Alain Prost has taken the advantage. Senna is trying to go through on the inside, and it's happened immediately. This is amazing. Senna goes off at the first corner, but what has happened to Prost? He has gone off too. Well, that is amazing, but I fear absolutely predictable. Yes, and that makes Ayrton Senna world champion this year. So Ayrton Senna uh, now with Prost not finishing the race quite clearly. He's out of his car, stuck in the gravel pit. That, I'm afraid to say, is the end of this year's Drivers' World Championship in favour of Ayrton Senna. There's Prost running back, but uh, it's all over for him. Again, you can, you can blame them both again. I, I do feel that this was very much... I think blame was much more equal between these two drivers than that film would have you believe. Prost was very political, yes, it's true. And, and here's the thing, he lost out to pole position to Senna at this race. And as you, most of you that watch the movie will know, Senna was saying, well, what, hang on a minute, they changed pole position then. Once they knew who got pole position, they changed it from one side of the grid to the other. Clearly favouritism to help Prost. Not, not reasonable. It doesn't matter who you support, you can't, you can't, move the goalpost, literally, which is what was happening. Now that was wrong, and Senna was within his rights. I don't agree with him smashing Prost off. Uh, and you can see that there was a major, major impacting when they actually did come together, entering the first turn at Suzuka. You can see the sparks and the fire there. Uh, looks like it started a fire at the back of the Ferrari, to be honest, it's quite dramatic. Now I don't really agree with what he did. And more to the point, neither did Ron Dennis. Ron Dennis actually said to him, which I'm, I think it's in one of the, um, the Senna movie versions, but I was watching the long version, it didn't show it, but uh, Ron Dennis was interviewed at length and he said to Ayrton, he said, congratulations on winning the world title, but I am very disappointed in you because of the way you won it. And he was not, Ron was not happy because he, Ron Dennis is a decent sporting guy at the end of the day and he didn't like that at all. He understood he understood it was Senna's way of writing a wrong or a perceived wrong, but he didn't like it. He didn't like the style of it, and I can understand that. So uh, that's how, it, and of course, Prost is at Ferrari by this time, and then Prost doesn't exactly, he didn't exactly blossom at Ferrari, and uh, and ultimately got got fired a year later. Senna went on to finally win his. He, I just zoom in for this. You don't see me. He went on, of course, in '91 um, with Gerhard Berger now as his teammate, of course, at McLaren, and he went on to win the Brazilian Grand Prix, as we all know, and that's featured in the Senna movie. And his final race at Adelaide in '93, and '93, I, I was saying that I was just my part in this. I was a Mansell fan, really, not a Senna fan, but I changed. At Man I didn't change my opinion of Nigel Mansell. I was a huge fan of his, and I thought he was treated very badly by Williams, by the way. And he went on to win the 93 IndyCar title, which was unbelievable, brilliant achievement. Meantime, Ayrton went to, uh, stayed at McLaren, but they had, they had this very underpowered engine, customer engine uh, from Ford, that didn't have their hydro-pneumatic valve operation. They got it eventually, I think maybe later in the season, they got, they got the same engine as the Benettons, who were the, the factory team. Because Honda had pulled out, of course, and that was the problem that, that they had. So they were lucky to keep Senna, but I really... Personally, I started to appreciate I I and Senna in 93 and at Donington. It just blew your mind. I haven't included that here because I didn't want to go on about that, really. Uh, we've, uh, everybody's talked about that so much. It was the most incredible performance. Yeah, Prost had seven pit stops. Twice he stalled the engine of the best car that's probably ever been created in Formula 1 in terms of driver aids and all that stuff. And he made an absolute botch of it. So... For me, Prost damaged his reputation that year. He had the best equipment and he just about... OK, he won the title by a country mile, but he should have won it by a much bigger margin. He had a huge advantage and he kept fluffing it up and the, the Donington thing was embarrassing. Senna ran rings around Prost 
at Donington. And that was the day I looked at Senna and I thought, my God, the real test, it's like Lewis Hamilton, which is, I'm not, I used to be Hamilton's biggest fan, I'm not really anymore. Uh, I kind of, I felt that he, a lot of his success has been down to the car. And when he's not had a great car, he's not been that great. And this is the difference with Senna. Senna had a not great car, probably the third best car. And he was still awesome. He still won in Monaco. He won at Donington. He won at Adelaide. Tricky, challenging circuits. He was phenomenal. And this is where my eyes to Ayrton Senna was really opened. And I became a fan in 93. Uh, you know, uh, when he wasn't winning anything, everything, he was only winning a few things. But you could see he was, he was better than the car. And you could see that astonishing ability, you know, that he had. Of course, in 1994, he went to Williams and we had this horrible weekend at Imola. Uh, Senna had a bad start to the season, crashed out of both the first two races. Um, and then we had Roland Ratzenberger here from Austria, lost his life in qualifying. And Senna was very upset about this and visibly so. Here he is in the Williams Renault, devoid of all its electronic aids now because of the change in the rules from the FIA. And <coughs> excuse me, and was very upset about this. And, and we now know subsequently that he had an un, a little furled up Austrian flag. He intended to win the race and he intended to um, be, be a tribute. It'd be a tribute. Now we get to the controversial bit that people won't, a lot of people won't know anything about what I'm going to talk about now. A lot of this is my opinion. It's based on the facts I saw, what I saw on the day, things I, photographs I've seen. My opinion of this accident that befell Senna, um, and it's conjecture because I don't think anybody's ever going to know the full truth. I'm not sure anybody's totally satisfied with the actual report. The, the claim, the official report claims that Williams re-welded the steering wheel because Senna wanted it, the position changed slightly and they claim it was a bad weld and it broke and this is what caused St uh, Senna to have a steering failure well I I don't agree with that um, the, the reasons are this one and, it, and it's difficult to be certain I know my opinion is based on this one there's almost no other in, in recent times there's no other recent precedent for a, a steering weld on a Formula 1 car to break and cause that kind of accident the loadings on, on the steering of a Formula 1 car, not like a, a big family car. A, a, a Formula 1 car weighs about 800 kilos. They're really light, yeah? The steering loads, okay, they're a little bit heavier in the corners when you've got the, the downforce, but they're not heavy loads on a steering column. And it's never happened before or since, has it? So I don't buy it. Yes, the steering column will break when you hit a wall at 180 miles an hour. You better believe it. Well, they say 150, don't they, when you hit the wall? But, I believe that that was not cause but effect of the accident. What I believe caused this accident, and I was convinced on the day, I watched it all live, and I was horrified. So what happened is, there was a horrible monumental crash at the start. I think it involved Pedro Lamy, JJ Leto, one or two other people. I think Leto's wheel, uh, one went into the back of the other, crashing across from the back of the grid. There was a huge amount of debris caused. One of the wheels went into the crowd, injuring people in the crowd. Because later in the day, another wheel injured people in the pit lane as well. Um, some terrible injuries and a horrible accident. But this accident at the start was one of the worst you've ever seen in terms of the debris field that was caused. There was debris thrown all over this circuit. And I mean, this is in the early days of carbon fibre, really. It was very sharp. You could see it was just littered everywhere. Now, the, and, the, and this is in the days when they had, this, the first time they had the, uh, the safety car, and what was it? It wasn't a, a super duper Aston Martin or a big Mercedes like we've had in recent years that's basically a touring car on steroids. No, it was a production saloon. It's basically an Opel Vectra. And it was hopelessly slow. And, and instead of stopping the race, I was actually standing watching this live, as I'm sure some of you were. And I was saying, for God's sake, red flag this race. Let them change their tyres and stop the race, clear the track, and let's just start again. Especially after the death the day before of Ratzenberger. Rubens Barrichello was in hospital. He had a horrible accident on the Friday. You'd think they'd have learned by now, but they didn't. And the first driver to run over all this debris was Ayrton Senna. Now, somebody else, I forget which other driver, had puncture. Was it Comas? Two or three had punctures. 
I believe, this is my personal theory now, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's conspiracy, but there are things that were done about this, lots of things around this incident that weren't right. For example, when the accident occurred, they didn't stop, they didn't cancel the event. If they'd have declared Ayrton was dead at the track, which is now thought to be true, then the, the event would have been cancelled. And, and Eccleston wouldn't allow that. Now, these are facts. Many people uh, that were there have that view as well. Uh, now, I'm not saying Eccleston was the devil or anything. He had, he had a lot of commercial interests. Lots of people had their livelihoods at, at stake at that event. You know, there are obligations and, and, and people need to be paid and need to be fed. And, and you could argue if Senna was dead, it wouldn't bring him back. But it's not very tasteful, was it? But anyway, coming back to the accident itself, and this photo, which I'm going to zoom you in now because I think it's more pertinent for you to see this. Now what I'm going to show you is not ultimately conclusive, it's not enough evidence for, for anybody to, to say, oh yes, that's definitely it. But I believe it is because I saw a lot of it at the time. Here's one of the last pictures of Senna as he's going round behind the safety car. But this is a very interesting photo that I wanted to show you. Now this was shown in, I think, the Sunday, Sunday Times? Sunday Times. This is um, exiting the grid area, heading down towards Tamburello. And this is just one example of one uh, photo that was taken of some of the debris that was on the circuit that Senna ran over. Um, it's not the greatest you know, resolution photo. But frankly, I think that this, um, this was picked up by Senna's car, for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm sure others picked up some of these bits that were... And they were, they were dragged around the circuit. There was punches all day long. Uh, several punches during the race later. So there was a lot of debris around. Now this photograph, somebody actually... I, I haven't done this. This is actually from the Sunday Times, I think it was. Uh, the journalist, I can't remember who it was, but he, he focused in on this. And they were saying, what killed Ayrton and Senna? And this is, this is where you start to think, well, hang on a second. If they'd have stopped the race, cleared the track, swept it, uh, as they would today, then we might be into a discussion. But look at the next photograph. So this, everything looks kind of normal on Senna's car when you look at the car here. Look, now this is a very bad photo because it's taken... I took this from the TV, so it's not very conclusive. But do you notice anything? Let's see if I can zoom you in. I noticed this live, watching it as the cars are going round. Senna's left rear, the right as you look at it, looks lower in profile than the right. Now, there was a big hoo-ha at the time that Goodyear, the Goodyear were absolutely paranoid that they didn't want to be... Nobody wants to get blamed for the death of Ayrton and Senna, one of the greatest drivers of all time. But I believe, I don't blame Goodyear particularly, but I believe that in that shot it almost looks like there's a bit of debris coming off. It's hard to tell if there's marks on the road or... It might be marks on the road, but it might be a little bit of tyre coming off. It's not conclusive, as I say. But what is conclusive, if you look at the heights of the two tyres, can you see that they're not even at the back, the rear tyres? Look carefully at this. Now, I know it's a poor quality. Can you see the height profile is not the same? And it's as though his car is sitting down a little bit on the left. Now, we know that it was sparking, and we know that this the car was bottoming out, and this was a factor in the accident, that much we do know, and he lost control. Uh, he started braking, and, and, and they say, oh, he's steering, so his steering must have been right. Well, he's on the grass. You go onto the grass at 180 mile an hour and turn your, turn your wheels sharp left. It's not going to steer left. It, it often won't, especially if the grass is damp. I, I contend that, and I'm not, I'm not starting a conspiracy theory, lots of people are going to disagree with this. I, I, my belief will never be shaken though. This theory about the steering column is the ultimate red herring. Flick onto the, oh that's the final shot isn't it, of Ayrton. Um, quite a nice one, I quite like this one. Taken I believe in 88 actually, uh, when he was in his first year with them. If you go back though, if you go back and look at some of the footage, look very very carefully at it. Because I could, I could, I, have, I was looking, I was thinking, because I recorded it all the time. I was thinking that tire doesn't look the same height. In several shots, it looks like so it's got a slow puncture, is what I'm thinking happened, and I think that is what contributed to the accident. Um, he lost pressure, it bottomed out, and that's why he was skidding and touching the ground as much as he was, because I think he had a slow puncture. He picked up some, and it's quite easily done, you know. And if the debris isn't, isn't super sharp, it won't necessarily make the tyre explode. Just give you a slow. Anyway, I didn't, I didn't come on to really espouse my theory about the accident that killed Ayrton. I really wanted to talk about Senna versus Pross, but um, it's interesting that on that fateful day that um, they had this conversation, which is talked about in the, in the Senna movie, which is accurate, obviously. And, um, 
and the fact that um, they see once they were no longer competing, they actually got on really well. Uh, and you know, Pross was working for French TV as a commentator, introducing the Grand Prix show. <coughs> Sorry, I just need a quick swig. Mm. Uh, and once the fire had gone out of this relationship, once they were no longer competing on the track, they were clearly about to have a different kind of relationship. And uh, and Pross said you could feel that strongly, and other people thought it as well. That, overheard him talking to him you know his, his manner changed completely so or, or, I guess what I'm saying in this Senna versus Prost uh, little show I've done here uh, as an intro to the uh, to the review of the, um, the kit which I'm going to do separately just for, to keep this tight we've also got this, um, and this by the way I should explain I don't own any of this I, own the, I do own the film <laughs> but this is actually a relative of mine who's, who's lent these to me this is an excellent book that I believe uh, Malcolm Foley, Senna vs Prost, you can get this um, still in bookshops I think, and this really tells the intense rivalry. It doesn't, I don't think it goes off, it doesn't tell the life story of Senna, it's really about these two men and, and how the two, you know, they couldn't let it go. But I am not, I was never Prost's biggest fan, only because, not because I didn't like him, I just thought he wasn't very spectacular to watch, whereas Senna and Mansell were. And PK was the same. I was never a big fan of PK. I think it was because he wasn't that spectacular. Um, Senna was always exciting, and Mansell was always exciting, which is why I was m migrated to those two drivers. Really, um, whether you know whether you believe this stuff about Senna's faith, he clearly was a very religious man, um, and he, he perhaps did put too much faith in his faith, if you know what I mean, um, which is kind of unfortunate. And I think it made him go to levels of performance that were beyond even Prost. You know, Prost was the best guy in Formula 1 and had been for a long time. And then Senna came in and took it up to, like Spinal Tap, he turned it up to 11, yeah? <laughs> a quite incredible uh, mercurial talent he was, no question about it. And could do things in a car that basically nobody else could do. Uh, and was prepared to take risks that nobody else was prepared to, to take. And I, I don't think that's why he died. I think, I think, as I've just said, I've got my own view of that. Um, I think that I think that that accident wouldn't happen today. I think the race would be stopped. The circuit would have been cleaned up. They'd have all changed their tyres, and Ayrton would still be with us today. That's my view, uh, and I don't think it had anything to do with steering comms. And the, the Williams team were hounded, and Adrian Newey and, and Patrick Head were all sort of indicted, and there was a court case. Absolutely absurd. And the Italian police did a terrible job of investigating it. You know, they didn't keep the car in a proper condition. It was stuck in a damp lockup where it corroded. And it absolutely ridiculous. You know, it was not a proper investigation. Uh, and, and they just, I think they just wanted to point the, the finger at Williams. And I'm not saying this because they're a British team. Wouldn't matter who they were. If it was Ferrari, I'd feel the same way. They just wanted to point the finger and have a simple, oh, well, you, yeah, the, the, the steering column was clearly broken when we examined the car. So that must have caused the accident. Well, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. And of course, sadly, it was the, uh, without getting into too many details, we all know that Ayrton died of this head injury he had because he was hit by a broken piece of the, the steering arm, uh, the, uh, the track rod arms, the actual suspension, I mean. Very, very sad. Uh, and such a, an astonishing talent, you know. Because I think he would have gone on to win the championship had he not had that accident and died. I think he would have won, I think he would have won in 94, uh, for sure, in the end. I think it was clearly that Williams came back, as you saw with Damon Hill, nearly won the title anyway. Senna would have won that title. I think he'd have won it. I think Schumacher would never have... I'm not saying would never have won a title, but I think he would have struggled in that era before Williams lost their Renault engines. I think that Senna would have won multiple titles with Williams. That's what I believe. But we'll never know for sure, as we'll never know, you know any more great detail. Um, all this analysis about Senna's crash, National Geographic did a programme and... So much hot air, I think, and analysing the steering wheel positions as if, as if when he's turning on the grass, as if that's the same as turning on the on the tarmac. It's quite ridiculous, I think. Well, there we go. Um, I don't expect people to agree with me, but um, I think it was there was a little bit of conspiracy is a big word, but Goodyear were terrified they would get the blame. Eccleston didn't want to, you know, admit that Senna died at the circuit, so they carried on with the event, and uh, several things were done very badly and it wasn't right but in summary going back to Prost and Senna 
Do not take the Senna movie as gospel. A lot of it is factual, yes, and it's a very entertaining film, and it's a very moving film. And I, I thought the way that, that it, they portrayed the end was very, very well done, actually. But you can see from the evidence I've shown you that there were several incidents that are documented, and you can you know, see articles by Prost that will confirm what I've told you. Um, that there was a lot more to this than met the eye, and it wasn't good versus evil. Uh, these two guys were warriors, the pair of them. There were two warriors, and they were at war. Um, I think Prost's mistake was was leaving McLaren, but because uh, he's going to Ferrari, I think. You know, and he, and he was very political, and he he played these political games with Nigel Mansell, which is one of the reasons that Mansell ultimately left and went back to Williams and became, thank goodness he did, because he became world champion as a result of that. But Senna, yeah. Unique, uh, unique. I, I personally think he probably was the greatest driver of all time. I think it's very difficult to compare them though through the years. But that's my take on it. That's my that's my view. So I'll be back very soon. I'm going to be doing the review of this incredible kit of this all conquering McLaren MP44. So please stay tuned for that. I hope you enjoyed this little talk and saw some interesting photos, some things you maybe didn't know. Hope you learned something. Um, you know, uh, nobody's got a monopoly on knowledge. There's, there's other people out there that must know more than I do, and I'd love to hear more about it, but perhaps they don't want to reveal it or, or what. We'll never know. You can never be 100% sure of these things. But there we are. Um, and on that note, I'm just going to say, um, Senna is, is, you know, he's greatly missed. It's a great shame that he didn't survive. I think that him and Prost could have become great buddies, and they clearly were heading in that direction. Um, once they were no longer fighting for world titles and uh, and he was a great loss to the to the world and, and to, to Brazil because in Brazil he's revered as a as a legend quite rightly so I think or probably more popular even than Pele so you know they lost a they lost such a, a wonderful figurehead and an ambassador for their country it was a great great tragedy you only had to see his funeral to understand that this man made, meant so much to so many people he was quite incredible but don't beat up Prost. Don't don't give him too hard a time. He was a bit naughty, but they kind of both were, you know. <laughs> anyway, that's my take on it. I hope you thought it was interesting. And on that note, I think I should finish off my I think I should, should finish off my little vid here, my little talk. I should put, well, respectfully put my Banco Nacional cap back on and say thank you very much for watching. Hope you'll give me a 10 out of 10, even if you didn't agree with everything I said or you didn't know about it. Um, I hope you found it interesting at least and we can have a debate about it and maybe it fires up another debate. It's, t it's 30 years this year, uh, in a few weeks really, it's 30 years since we lost Ayrton on the 1st of May. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's quite a sad anniversary. So I thought, I thought it was right that I, I sort of made a bit of an effort because I, I did become a big fan of his. By the end, I was a huge fan and I was very upset, like many of us were, about what happened. And miss him very much. I hope you feel the same. Anyway, thank you very much. Give us a 10 out of 10 if you would for my video. And stay tuned because we're going to have the Meng Prost vs Senna kit to review. I think you find that really fascinating. And I'll talk some more about the car on that. Okay, in the meantime, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, stay well, stay safe. Don't forget to tune in for the next vid. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves and bye for now.